Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you and welcome to our Think New York webinar. We're thrilled to have you join us today. My name is Kyle Davis. I'm the Director of Public Affairs with the Empire Center, and I'm, I'm really thankful that you could be here. Uh, this Think New York webinar series is designed to give folks an opportunity to tap into the expertise of End Center, Empire Center experts on a monthly basis. So we will have more of these moving forward. Our special guest today is E.J. McMahon. Most of you probably know him well. He's the founding senior fellow of the Empire Center for Public Policy. He has 30 years of experience as an Albany-based analyst and close observer of New York state government. EJ's work focuses on improving New York State's economic competitiveness, promoting transparency, accountability, and fiscal responsibility in state and local government. He has authored many pieces uh, and major studies on, on such things as public pension reform, collective bargaining, population migration, budget trends, and tax policy in New York. Today, he's going to be specifically talking about the budget process. So, Sit back and relax, and EJ, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here uh, with us today. Well, hello. Um, I'm um, hello. I'm ha happy to see you all. I think unless you, if you can't see me, well, you're not missing much. Oh, there I am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Thanks for the opportunity to do this. Um, so, without any further ado, I'm going to talk today about the state budget process. And I want to stress up front now, as we said in the invitation, this is explaining the background, including the uh, historical background of the budget process, the rules by which the budget has to be done. I'm not going to get into current issues much, except perhaps illustrating some of the process questions. This is what is the process that's about to unfold in New York? What are the rules that govern it? What uh, types of leverage do the players in the process, the governor and the legislature, have over one another? And I'm gonna. That's what I'm gonna go through, and then I'd be happy to have uh, have uh, questions at the end, and we can talk about issues related to that. <clears throat> so, without any further ado, let's um, let's start with uh, a title that actually relates to an issue brief that I is put out a couple of years ago, actually 2019, about the budget process, which we'll make a point of telling you how to get it at the end. That reviews some of this history in further de detail. The budget process is unbalanced by design, is the title of our the issue brief I did originally. If I if a picture could say uh, could uh, provide a thousand words worth of description of what the balance of power is in the budget process, um, it would probably be this one, which is whoops, I don't have the buttons at the bottom of my screen, Kyle. Um, ah, whoops. <laughs> So this is this picture kind of describes what the dynamics of the budget process are, which is that through under the constitutional as as vested in Article Seven, the governor's in the driver's seat. The two legislative majority leaders <clears throat> are along for the ride and can uh, be front seat drivers, if you will, and say where they'd like to go. But the governor is behind the wheel. That's the controller, Tom DiNapoli, there peeking up from the corner who is sort of an onlooker, except in one limited situation, which I'll get to maybe. But the governor is in the driver's seat. This has been the case for now 95 years in New York. And I'm going to explain how this situation evolved and uh, why it evolved the way it has. Uh, if you're a Republican working in a legislature, the minority leaders are in the back seat uh, where they can barely peer over the shoulders of the people in front of them. So that's the way that's set up. So let's go to 1915, which is where this all starts. There's the state capitol in 1915, when you could still walk up the steps and and uh, even enter the building without uh, going through a metal detector. In 1915, that we have the roots of the current Constitution and the Constitution's executive budget law. In fact, one of the roots is a man named Root. That guy in the middle there is Elihu Root. And the photo on the left is Henry Stimson. And these are two uh, uh, great Brahmins, uh, great Republican lawyers, very politically wired. Each had served in a president's cabinet already. Henry Stimson in Taft's, Elihu Root and Theodore Roosevelt's. They are New York lawyers. Stimson had run for governor and lost, by the way, a few years earlier. He later would be in Franklin Roosevelt's cabinet. These are two leading lights of Republican progressivism. Progressivism in its early 20th century form was not just about 
expanding the role of government or simplistically about using government to meet the social needs of a growing immigrant population or a new industrial economy. It was also about improving government efficiency. That was a big part of the progressive movement. And progressives believed in vesting more accountability and authority in executives at every level. So in New York, they were proposing to streamline and modernize the executive branch. And a crucial part of this involved changing the budget process. They have a 1915, in 1915, they have a constitutional convention and a crucial ally of theirs <clears throat> in assembling and promoting uh, modernization of the executive branch and of the budget process is the democratic leader of the assembly. At this point, the minority leader, they had had the majority for a few years, who is a up and coming politician named Alfred E. Smith. Al Smith provides the crucial uh, political ballast for the proposal to update government in, in every way in, in 1915. He becomes an ally of Root and Stimson in proposing modernization of the budget process along lines that have been suggested by an or a reform organization of the kind uh, known as the Municipal Research Bureau. It was kind of a forerunner of today's Citizens Budget Commission, sort of. Um, and the person behind their proposals was a young staffer named Robert Moses, <clears throat> which then this begins ultimately leads to his affiliation with Smith a few years later. So they propose all of this, including an executive budget law in the 1950, in a constitutional amendment in 1915. Now, by the way, crucially, Smith had supported this aspect of their proposal, but as a loyal uh, soldier of Tammany Hall, when um, this, the proposed constitutional changes go on the ballot, he actually opposed them because that was the Democratic Party's position based on, on other aspects of the changes. So in 1915, the, 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 is first voted on. Now, why, what was the justification for this? Well, speaking of Robert Moses, you can go to um, the great book we all know about Robert Moses, The Power Broker, which tells a lot of this story and has a great miniature biography of Smith laced through its early chapters. The budget that was called the state budget, it was basically a collection of appropriations from the legislative fiscal committee chairmen. It was a wish list of spending the legislature wanted. And they'd pull it all together in one document. Then they keep adding to it. Nobody bothered to add it up. No one could be sure how much they had appropriated. The governor had a veto power, but he didn't have line item veto. So what what you could do is you could put a lot of stuff, you could bury really bad stuff in bills that you knew the governor couldn't afford to veto. Um, so it was a mess. And Smith, um, as a Democrat, agreed with the Republicans that this was an ungodly mess that should be changed. He wanted to bring order and efficiency to this. By the way, to a greater extent than not, this description applies largely to the federal budget as it's done even today, where the president puts has this big um, uh, production and putting out his own budget ideas every year, his own budget proposals, but it's actually Congress and the House of Representatives in particular writes the bills and Congress controls the budget in the, from the beginning to the end. The president has a veto, but not a line item veto. So this is what was proposed in New York. This statement from the power broker explains why, and this is very much Smith's perception because he had been in the legislature and he had seen this go on. It was you can, and you can imagine the legislature now would be the same way. If you let the legislature write the budget bills, initiate the budget, and control the process, this is what would happen. So in November 1915, the proposals go to a vote, and it's defeated. Uh, it's defeated for a lot of reasons, in, in part, in large part, because there's a whole lot of stuff in, this, in these proposed constitutional changes. They wrap them all up into a single proposition, and... Uh, when you put it all together, there were enough things in here that people didn't like in one part of the state or another to lead to its easy defeat. And as I said, Tammany in New York City was against it also for a lot of reasons unrelated to the executive budget change. So in November 1915, it goes down to defeat. Three years later, Al Smith selected to the first of his several terms as governor. The governor then served two, two years terms. The legislature served one year terms. He's elected in 1918. He serves in 19 and 20. He loses to a Republican in the very strong National Republican year of 20, 1920. He comes back in 1922, and he devotes hit the rest of his gubernatorial tenure, which stretches over several two-year terms from 1922 through 1928, 
to modernizing the executive branch and the executive budget. And what happens is the executive budget provisions go back on the ballot, along with other proposed constitutional changes in 1927, and they win big. And they're seen as a big victory for Smith. The first governor to introduce an executive budget under the new law, which is the law that still exists today, is Smith's successor, Franklin Roosevelt. In January 1929, 95 years ago, Franklin D. Roosevelt proposes the first executive budget. And right away, the legislature chafed at the way this was working. It gave a lot of power to the governor. They were obviously, not surprisingly, they were not used to this. They didn't like it. There's tension right away. And uh, to say the least, there's also litigation. But let's go over first what it involves. So the, here's the key provisions of, of Article 7. These are still in effect today. These are the key aspects of the budget law to understand. This controls the process. First, the governor assembles all the departmental estimates. He starts having uh, open meetings with department, with state executive agency heads the prior fall, his budget staff does, which the legislature can attend, and they lay out what their, their needs are. The governor modify, assembles those needs, modifies them, and, and proposes, assembles them in, an appro in appropriations bills, along with a, a plan of expenditures, quote unquote, of all monies and revenues to be available. And he puts together a legend, he or she puts together a legislative package. I'm going to end up saying he a lot today and um, out of long habit, but I obviously mean the current governor as well. So the governor assembles what's needed to be in the in the coming budget um, the governor drafts appropriations bills and submits appropriation bills to the legislature which introduces them which has to introduce them they're introduced with no sponsor they their sponsor is budget bill that's what they're that's their classification both houses the senate and the assembly introduce the budget bills along with any supporting legislation that are not appropriation bills, but statutory changes that are necessitated by proposals in the budget. The easiest one to understand would be a tax increase. If you're going to, if you need to increase taxes or create a new tax to finance the budget, that's not done in an appropriations bill, that's done by a statutory change. The statutes accompanying the appropriation bills have come to be known in Albany as so-called Article 7 bills. The Article 7 bills are statutes. Okay, the appropriation bill language the governor submits has to specifically relate to some particular appropriation in those bills. It can't refer to something other than itself, if you will, which is very important. We'll get to that in a minute. The governor can amend or supplement his or her budget bills within 30 days. This leads to what are known in Albany now as the 30-day bills or the 30-day amendments. The legislature, this is crucial. I probably should have boldface this, bold this and put it in red. This is the part that is really the tension point between the governor and the legislature because this is the root of the governor's authority in the process. The legislature cannot change appropriations language except to strike out or reduce line items. So each appropriation has a specific line with a number in it, a figure, a dollar figure. The legislature cannot change the appropriations. It can't change the wording and it can't change the amount. It can strike out or reduce the amount, meaning erase it or make it a smaller number. And there's nothing the governor can do about it, nothing. Once passed, the appropriation bills become law without further action by the governor. There's a great misnomer you hear every year. After there's a budget deal done, the budget bills are passed. You'll hear it announced. The governor is going to, quote, unquote, sign the budget bills. The governor does not sign appropriation bills. Repeat, not. They become law as soon as they are passed. With one exception, anything the legislature has added, any separate item added by the legislature, is subject to the governor's approval or veto. So that's what the governor needs to approve. And every year there's a lot of items that are done as part of a budget deal that are added to the governor's budget. So for instance, the governor proposes a billion dollar increase in school aid, the legislature wants a billion and a half. The added half billion is in an added separate line, the governor must approve that line or he or she can veto that line. Um, more changes. 
Okay. Um, so this becomes, like I said, a point of tension right away. Um, just want to get to one other part here. Um, the legislature, another important, one last important issue here. The legislature cannot introduce any additional appropriation bills of its own until the governor's budget bills have been finally acted on. That's been another important tension point. It's another important source of leverage and authority for the governor. So they cannot introduce their own separate additional appropriation bills until they've acted upon the governor's budget bills. Okay, so this this is a right from the beginning. The legislature doesn't like this. Right from the beginning, there's legislation. There's two cases known as the Tremaine cases. That sourpuss there on the left is a guy named Morris Tremaine, who was the state comptroller for from the late twenties through the late thirties, and the cases were constructed as lawsuits naming Morris Tremaine as the defendant, although he had otherwise not much to do with it. So the first Tremaine case, right in Franklin Roosevelt's first year in office involving the first budget, finds that the legislature can't amend the budget by designating the fiscal committee chairs to have a role in divvying up any lump sum within an appropriation, at that they can't attempt to circumvent the governor's veto power by adding other items to the budget bills. That's number. That's the first big challenge the governor wins. Ten years later, at this point, Herbert Lehman's governor, Tremaine's still controller, there's another set of Tremaine cases that clarifies that the legislature can't alter a bill by striking out the governor's items and replacing them with the same purpose in a different form. In other words, you don't like the way the governor has structured an appropriation for, say, the state police. You can't erase the whole thing because the governor can, the legislature can delete or erase or reduce remember. But you can't simply replace it with your own pre preferred version. You can change the number, but you can't come up with an entirely new appropriation. You can add items of appropriation provided they're, uh, they're stated separately and distinctly from the original items of the bill, and they refer to a single object or purpose. Again, very important. Everything needs to be exposed to a veto. Let me make a point and note this here, by the way. This is a conscious purpose of the executive budget law in New York State was something Smith himself thought was very important. Now, Smith himself is, the, is, a, is a, among the liberal and progressive Democrats of his day, but he believes in economy and government. The whole executive budget law has a bias toward making it easier to hold down or restrain spending and making it most difficult to increase spending beyond what a governor prefers. That's an important bias in the law. So there's another big, there's several other lawsuits over the years. The, one of the last big ones in the 20th century is Bankers v. Wetzler. That's Jim Wetzler there, who's still very much around, who was the tax commissioner of the time. The Bankers Association of the state filed a suit with naming him as the defendant, just as the stand-in for the Cuomo administration of the time, Mario Cuomo. The, the legislature had added a bank audit fee to an appropriations language in a budget bill, basically as a revenue raiser. The governor, by the way, had shrugged this off. This was done in negotiations, and the governor and his people said, fine, go ahead. He didn't mind. However, the Bankers Association sued over this and says you can't – the form in which they did it, simply adding it to the language of the governor's appropriation, violated the Constitution. The Court of Appeals agreed. Then this come the two big cases, right at the end of the 1990s and early 2000s. First is Silver v. Pataki. After the 1998-99 appropriation bills uh, had been passed, the legislature followed with its own Article 7 bills, changing the purposes for which the money could be spent. I'm not sure why this came back. Is somebody on my... Uh, hold on a second. Go. Then... In, a few years later, there's another dispute because Pataki's 2001-2 budget bills put all of his proposed changes in the school aid formula in appropriations language, which the legislature didn't like. Legislature deleted that language, struck entire appropriations, and put in substitutes. So that leads to a decision. It's confusing. I won't get into all the nuances because there were... There were multiple concurrences and dissents over aspects of the two different cases, which were merged. But the ultimate decisions, which came out in uh, December 04, were five to two in favor of the governor, basically. 
there was broad agreement with Judge Robert Smith's opinion that in both budgets, the legislature had gone further than it could under the Constitution. It had altered the appropriations in ways not permitted by the Constitution. Legislatures very unhappy with this and began then to claim something it has claimed ever since, which is not accurate. And don't just trust me, Robert Smith would say the same thing. They, can, they have claimed ever since then that this is outrageous. It means the governor can write changes to entire state laws merely by putting them in appropriation bills, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's actually not true, I think. And a lot of, I think, the legal authorities think too. But that's been their argument against this. The, the legislature in general does not like this. So first thing the legislature does is in 2004, it passes a resolution, passes it again in 2005, puts it on the ballot in 2005, a proposal to significantly rewrite the executive budget law in a way that would significantly um, reduce the power of the governor and increase the power of the legislature to have the final word. Here's a rundown of uh, what it did. It didn't change some of the first initial uh, articles under, under uh, uh, sections of, of Article 7, but then here's the key. Remember now that under Article 7, the legislature can't do any other appropriation bill until the governor's bill has been finally acted on. What the legislature did was provide that, well, if we get to the end of the fiscal year and we still haven't acted on the budget and the new fiscal year starts, we can come up with our own bills. Uh, and if the budget's late after the end of a fiscal year, we can enact a, con a contingency budget effectively takes effect, which is the same budget continuing into the new year, that the legislature can then amend the contingency budget uh, in a single bill with line item changes uh, that are still subject to the governor's veto, and that failure to act on a governor's budget uh, before the end of the year is considered final action, so legislative pay is never interrupted because there's been a law in effect since 1998 that says the legislature isn't paid if there's not a budget in place at the end of a fiscal year, when at the start of a new fiscal year. This was a big um, uh, attempted shift by the legislature. Now, at the time, uh, as we pointed out, it gives them an enormous would have given them an enormous new incentive to delay action on the budget. And at at this point in history. The overriding concern about the state budget is that at this point, it's now been late for 15 years in a row or so. It has been enacted well after the start of the fiscal year most years. This is the ongoing public concern that's being talked about the most. Well, this if the legislature had done this, if this proposal had passed, the legislature would have had an incentive to delay further. It would have promoted bigger spending increases by making it easier for the legislature to ignore attempts at restraint or reform. It, would require, it wouldn't require the legislature to disclose the impact of changes to the governor's budget proposal, and it wouldn't require a balanced budget, which is required uh, initially in the proposal. So what happened? And, and again, what was the justification for this? Well, I, Joe Bruno, who was then the Senate Republican Senate Majority Leader, explained, well, you know, people are angry about us. We've had 20 consecutive years of late budgets. And, you know, we're going to fix the late budget problem by, by making the process run better and end the string of late budgets. That's how the legislature promoted it. The Empire Center, um, uh, with the cooperation of the Manhattan Institute, had a forum in New York City that was very well attended in the fall of that year before this vote, in which we had a whole number of speakers talking about this in opposition to the proposal, and the most prominent of whom was Governor, former Governor Hugh Carey. Uh, and you carry uh, what gave a very strong speech opposed to the proposal in absolutely in no uncertain terms. And there's the, his main quote there, as you see, is it's a power grab and a purse grab. By the way, the exclamation point is the way he said it. I didn't insert that, you know, to, to call attention to it. Um, he he found it alarming and he was very strong in his statement against it. We also had Ed Koch at that uh Forum and Ed Koch called it in, in vintage Koch style. He called the proposal nuts, and then there were several other speakers. So, and we we were active opponents of this change. Um, there was a small campaign uh, supported by some conservatives uh, that had. I think there was a single TV ad that also opposed proposal one. But all the the legislature as a whole all supported it. What happened? It lost big. It lost two to one. By a two-to-one margin statewide, Proposal 1 was defeated. Um, 
in Rensselaer County, which was the county is Joe Bruno's county, it lost by a bigger margin. It lost three to one. So even though Joe was very popular in Rensselaer County and uh, right till the end of his tenure, um, and there's uh, a baseball stadium over there to this day named after him, on this issue, they voted three to one against his position. And it was also a larger margin in other parts of the capital region. So we get to 2005, and basically Article 7 and the executive budget law at this point has stood the test of time and has has survived several uh, attempts to undermine it in court, up to the state's highest court, and has survived a direct attempt to have it overridden and weakened by a vote of the people of the state in 2005. The next important things that happens, and it's it's too forgotten in too many circles today, but the 2010 budget battle was really important. At this point, Governor David Patterson, having succeeded Elliot Spitzer, uh, had hoped to run himself. Now he's decided not to run himself. He's being battered by bad publicity. He's not running for election to the office he had moved up to. He's having a budget battle with the legislature. And the legislature, this is in the midst of the financial crisis and the stock market meltdown. States' revenues have plunged. And I, I don't know why that just went up. Um, and so what happens is he is trying to restrain the legislature. The legislature wants to add to his budget. And there's another budget delay looming. The budget's not done by the start of the fiscal year. So what happens is uh, Patterson it first does the thing that the Constitution requires. If the budget's not done, but you still need to authorize spending to keep state government running, Patterson does something that his predecessors had all done, most notably Mario Cuomo and George Pataki, had sent up two week at a time extender bills to allow the government to have appropriations authority to continue running while budget negotiations continued. And this is actually why budgets were were so late throughout that period, because the governor in part actually enabled it by giving the legislature a week at a time, two week at a time, extender bills while budget talks continued. So Patak, Patterson initially does that, but then when they wouldn't budge on it, he decides to begin force feeding them his large chunks of his own full annual budget during the, during the uh, late period as a way of basically saying to the governor, either do this or you've got no budget. So by in piecemeal fashion, by the end of June, he had managed to pull this off. Why? The key is, remember, um, he had the, the Senate Republican minority conference had just one vote shy, shy of a majority. So the, the, the Democratic majority in the Senate then was very small. And the Republicans were with the governor. So the Democrats in the Senate did not have enough votes to override the governor's veto of anything they attempted to add to his bills. And so they didn't even try uh, until the end. And the Patterson vetoed 6,600, almost 6,700 budget item, items. Now, but, now, Pataki had vetoed hundreds of items in his last term. Um, Patterson, I think, set the record for budget vetoes with over, you know, with thousands of budget vetoes including a big increase in school aid and pork barrel stuff. And basically the legislature had to surrender and, and do the budget on his terms and do the revenue bill on his terms. And his vetoes went unchallenged. So that was a big fateful change because that actually set the stage for Andrew Cuomo in the first four years of his administration, the budget was on time every year, which had not happened in decades because the legislature was aware, freshly reminded of the governor's ability to follow this strategy. So now, let, where are we now? Where does that leave us now? What are we looking ahead to? We've got the governor is going to be presenting her budget next Tuesday, next Monday, pardon me. No, Tuesday. I'm sorry. It's Martin Luther King Day is Monday. That day is set by the Constitution. The Constitution says it's the second Tuesday following the start of the legislative session, except in the year after an election gubernatorial election, which is February 1st. So the deadline is next Tuesday. That's when she's presenting the budget. That's constitutionally required. Uh, the fiscal year start is April 1st. That's not in the Constitution. The, the fiscal year is set by statute. The vast majority of states, there's only two states other than New York that don't have a fiscal year starting July 1st, running through June 30th. New York is, is in a very, only I think a Texas has a weird sort of two-year budget that begins in the fall. 
I think one other state has a different schedule, but the norm for all states is July 1st to June 30th. That was the case in New York. And then during World War II, for reasons that are lost in the mists of time offhand, the state changes it to April 1st. It's been April 1st ever since. That's in statute. It could be changed by a change in law tomorrow. The statute also requires that the legislative fiscal staffs and the governor's budget division have a consensus revenue forecasting conference by the end of February, which they've done. And it requires that they produce, based on that conference, their own consensus forecast on or before March 1st. This is an attempt to get disagreements about revenue out of the way. It was a budget reform enacted under Spitzer in 2007. Then there's things that are done by custom. The legislature has adopted the custom, but it's not required by law, of adopting what are called the one-house budget resolutions in mid-March. They don't change the budget bills. They introduce their own preferred versions of budget bills, which become what are known as B and C prints of the governor's original bills, but they don't vote on them. They rather, they, they basically install their desires or do they describe their wish list for budget changes in resolutions and they pass those resolutions by mid-March, sometimes the first week in March, more often recently in mid-March, within two weeks of the end of the fiscal year, the legislatures stake out in public what they want to do to the budget. Now, before this in late January, by the way, late January, early February, the legislative fiscal committees hold joint public hearings um, which are basically a parade of people, including in past years, the likes of us, uh, stating their position on the budget. Um, these are largely performative, though, frankly. They, they, they're not, they don't tell the legislature so much what anything it doesn't know. It basically gives the legislature an idea of where all the interest groups are standing on the issues. There is, a, is there a budget adoption deadline? The answer is no. There never has been. There is no budget ad adoption dead, deadline. The legislature has to be conscious that it doesn't get paid if there's no budget by the, by the time the fiscal year ends. But other than that, there is no deadline. There's no nothing requiring, legally requiring the adoption of a budget by March 31st. Uh, as I said, in past years, when it wasn't done by then, a so-called extender bill would be passed to authorize spending until a deal was reached. The governor, by law, is required to update the financial plan tables uh, at a, in, in 30 within 30 days of the end of each financial quarter, um, which the dates of which are there now, as you can note, basically that deadline is met by the governor with the uh, executive budget proposal by the end of January and with the budget, the the assumed budget adoption by the end of April. And so the, really the two most closely watched financial plan updates are at the end in midsummer at the end of July and in late fall at the end of October. Uh, and then the process begins all over again with the uh, information sharing and revenue forecasts shared among the legislature and the governor with the controller's input in November. So what is the product? What are we going to see on Tuesday? You're going to see you're going to see five appropriation bills based on recent models, state operations, legislative and judiciary, debt service, aid to localities, capital projects. In the days before uh, the sharing of things on the internet in PDF form. <clears throat> this would, these things amounted to a stack of paper well over a foot high. So last year, as an example, there were almost 2,800 pages just in the appropriations bills, the largest of which is the aid to localities bill, which is over a thousand pages, followed by the state ops bill. Um, then there's what's called the Article Seven legislation. These are the statutory changes necessary to enact the budget. This is where the most action has been in recent years, especially under Governor Andrew Cuomo. Governor Andrew Cuomo began the process of simply installing his entire programmatic, his entire program, his policy program, the, the policies, uh, preferences, and proposals he laid out in his state of the state. He, he would simply insert them in Article 7 bills. Even though, even though many of them had nothing to do with the budget. Case in point, in 2019, he was proposing uh, changes to the, uh, um, to the abortion law, to uh, other aspects of law. He proposes original mi minimum wage change in a budget bill. He, any, all sorts of, all manner of programs the governor would install in his Article 7 bills. Here's the thing that's important to realize, and this will happen again this year as, as last year. Governor Hochul 
proposed changes to criminal justice laws last year and her whole housing program last year was in Article 7 bills. And I would fully expect next week her Article 7 bills will include all the items she talked about in her state of the state. The legislature has to act on appropriations bills and is very limited in its ability to change appropriations bills, as I described. But the legislature is free to ignore or rewrite or, or, or add to Article 7 bills to its heart's content. Those are statutes. They're not budget appropriation bills. And so when you hear it reported that, gee, our hands are tied, the governor put this in his budget or her budget. Uh, this is terrible. The governor has too much power. Why she's put things in the budget that have nothing to do with the budget. That, I mean, that's a non-starter. That, that's an excuse. I think some legislators don't understand it and they think that's what it means. But in fact, the legislature is free to ignore what's in an Article 7 bill or rewrite it to its heart's content. They know this. They often act as if they don't know it. Uh, but that's the fact. And this is the battlegrounds are all usually often over Article 7 legislation in addition to spending increases and the level of spending and taxes. Revenue bills are Article 7 bills. A tax increase or a tax cut is, a, is an Article 7 bill. And legislators are free to change that also, subject to the governor's veto. And where we stand now is the Democrats have super majorities in both houses. That is, they have more votes than they need in the assembly and they have exactly as many votes as they need in the Senate to override a gubernatorial veto of anything they change or add. So that is where the governor comes out of the driver's seat and the passengers take over. If the two houses feel strongly enough to uh, act in unison to override gubernatorial vetoes, there have not been overrides of gubernatorial budget vetoes, of significant overrides of gubernatorial budget vetoes since the Pataki era, when there were many, many veto overrides. Uh, in the 2003 to 05 period, when the governor was at odds with the legislature over taxes and spending levels. So what's going to come out on Tuesday is going to be, if you printed it all out, three to 4,000 pages of material. But what everybody looks like, and in, in days of yore in New York, we used to have the, the, the budget geeks would wait for budget morning. It was like Christmas every, uh, a second Christmas every year. One of the things, the most closely held secrets in Albany was what color will the budget division make the budget books this year? The budget books are a description of what the governor is trying to do. They're not legislation. They are narratives with packed with tables of numbers that tell you what the state's actually expecting and projecting it will disperse, that is spend in cash terms, and how much it expects to take in in revenue terms. All of the dense details that are of greatest immediate interest to anyone trying to follow the budget are in the so-called books. This is a shelf of old books that we have in our office. Um, the state and the budget division stopped printing the books 10 years ago, actually 14 years ago, and they are available now as PDFs. This is the ones that were put out last year at this time by Governor Hochul. And uh, if you insist on reading things in print, like for instance, I do, uh, you get your printer busy all day printing out the books on paper and uh, maybe putting them in a, uh, drilling three holes in them and then reading them. But if you read them electronically, this is, it's these books in PDF form. And what they have in them, among other things, are the tables that tell you what the state expends to raise and spend in cash, which is the core issue. There's three crucial measures these are not the only three, but these are the first three that you look at. The all funds budget measure includes federal grants and reimbursements, special revenues, and bonded capital. When you, the largest number you hear, when you hear the, when you hear or read media reports referring to a two hundred billion dollar budget, two hundred something billion dollar budget, the largest number that's the all funds number, and that includes a large amount of money from Medicaid, from federal uh, programs, especially Medicaid, and capital spending. The core measure is state operating funds, which funds the operation of state agencies and includes all spending supported by state revenues. That is revenues raised by the authority of the state legislature via taxes, fees, the lottery, tuition revenues, um, whether or not it's dedicated for a specific purpose. That, that all adds up to state operating funds. That's the core measure 
And then the last measure I, that used to be the primary measure is the general fund, which is all revenues not dedicated for some purpose. Uh, during the first Governor Cuomo era, uh, we increasingly began dedicating revenues, especially the dedicated highway fund. And really, the main measure is the state operating funds, as opposed to the general fund, which is included in state operating funds. So that's the number you go to right away when you can grab the books online and look at them on Tuesday. Here's the table, for instance, a lot of us look at. This is the state operating funds disbursements table that shows the major categories of receipts and disbursements. And then there's tables breaking these out further in one of those books. The bottom line there, right, this line down here, if you can see my arrow, I'm moving back and forth. That's the gap. If the number in parentheses means there's a budget gap and the size of the budget gap in millions of dollars is that number. So as you see, as of mid-year, meaning last October 31st, the gaps were projected at $4.3 billion for the year we're about to begin. So the governor has to close a $4.3 billion budget gap as forecast in October. She has to have a balanced budget that somehow takes care of that $4.3 billion problem. The problem is, is projected to grow to over $9 billion the year after that, if left unaddressed, and to over $7 billion the year following that. Um, these are the bottom line spending and receipt figures. So these are the figures you look at in the budget when it comes out. Uh, all right, so I've kind of, I've overlined, I've outlined what the general items in the budget are, what the governor's budget power is and what to look for on Tuesday. This is an overview and I know that it's kind of scattershot moving place to place, but I think now we can, I can stop and we can talk about questions or arguments or whatever. Perfect. Thank you so much, EJ. We do have a few questions in the chat, so we'll just okay. go through some of those. So, uh, what choice do lawmakers have if the governor puts something in an Article 7 that isn't related to the budget? How should that work, or how would that work? Um, one way to do it is to, is to ignore it, not pass it, and then prepare to file suit with the expectation of a Court of Appeals decision, because so far, no governor has ever pushed that to the limit. And the, uh, Andrew Cuomo uh, took a stab several times at, in several of his budgets and several of his sets of 30-day amendments. He proposed what would have been, I think, a step too far. He proposed forcing issues unrelated to the budget through budget language. He did this a number of times, but in the final analysis, whenever the, when the final budget was done each of those years, he, didn't, he took that language out. The legislature... Legislative leaders would have told him, we're not going to do that. And he backed off. It's never been pushed that far. I, I, think, this, I think the Court of Appeals would, would absolutely rule in favor of the legislature if a governor tried to ever push to the limit what Governor Cuomo attempted to do. For instance, in 2019, he had a, I have here in front of me, like the budget language he had, where he had, for instance, a paragraph in the appropriations for the State Board of Elections, which is a minor agency, three and a half million dollars. But in that paragraph, he had a, a language that said, notwithstanding any other provision of law, funds from this appropriation can't be used or spent unless the legislature has enacted a chapter of law identical to, and then he kind of is a, a verbal gesture to some language in an Article 7 bill he proposed. That has to do with campaign financing, he, a campaign finance reform proposal he had. And basically, he had language to the effect that said, you can't, here's the appropriation for the Board of Elections, but it cannot be spent unless you also pass that other bill over there in that Article 7 package that changes the campaign finance law. Now, I think that would be clearly unconstitutional. And if and if Governor Hochul attempted such a thing, let's say in part of our housing program or a criminal justice reform, um, and proposed doing something like that in this budget and refused to change that language, the legislature could simply just not enact it um, or change the language um, and file suit immediately to get it to the Court of Appeals to have uh, – um, have the issue clarified. And I think the Court of Appeals would say that the governor can't do that. And my final thing, and Judge Robert Smith, who's a former Judge Robert Smith, retired, who's very much with us, um, as he as he put it at our forum on this in 2019, and he said in other interviews, the, his, the court's view of this in the 
Pataki Silver decisions was, yeah, there's a limit to what the governor can do, but that Pataki had not gone beyond that limit. But the court's position was basically like the famous Potter Stewart quote. There was a pornography case in which Potter Stewart memorably said, was ruling that something was or wasn't pornography. And his his famous line in his opinion was, I know it when I see it. And the court basically was saying in that case, yeah, there's going to be a limit and we'll know it when we see it. And I think what you describe in the question is something that would be a limit and they'd know it when they saw it. Thank you, EJ. Um... And I should mention, if anyone has any questions, feel free to add them in the chat. We only have a few minutes left, but I want to make sure we touch on some of the key questions people had. Um, another question that came in is, why doesn't the governor combine the state of his, the state and the budget presentation? Wouldn't that make more sense? Um, the answer is, A, Andrew Cuomo did it, I think, one or two times, maybe three. And no, it does not make sense. In fact, I thought it was a terrible idea because the state of the state is packed with things that are not related to the budget. And that, that was part of Andrew Cuomo's attempt to blur the di distinction between the two. He would frequently claim a little outlandishly that the only thing that matters is the budget and it's gotta be done on the budget or it's not gonna be done. That's what he would say programmatically. But in fact, issues that are not specifically related to spending dollars and cents should not be all crammed into the budget process. Number one, obviously, is I, in terms of the dates, it's a highly compressed uh, calendar. The, the budget has should be done by April 1st. Basically, the legislature has a little over two months, two and a half months, uh, to consider all the issues that are in the budget. You'd basically be saying that the governor, that the entire program agenda has to be enacted by halfway through the legislative session. Even if you change the fiscal year to July 1st, which by the way, I think should be done, um, the budget is is not the place to consider programmatic initiatives that are not related specifically to the budget, that, that, that the difference should not be blurred and that the two things should be kept separate. Uh, on a related note, we did have a question come in asked, what, what do you think the main change would be if they change, or what do you think the ramifications would be if they changed the fiscal year to July 1st? Uh, the main, well, first of all, keeping in mind that that's the way it is in every other state with a couple of exceptions, we'd be more normal in that sense. I think we would see uh, it, there'd be a process that's a bit more aired out. Um, it would uh, require closer attention and coordination with the city of New York and with school districts, which also have July 1st fiscal years. Uh, but that I don't think is an insurmountable problem. I think we in general would have better and more transparent budgets if they if the budget process and the adoption process played out over a longer period of time. One thing we know for sure is uh, one of the disadvantages of having a fiscal year that starts April 1st is that you actually don't have ac have the information yet, the total number for the final settlement under the state income tax, which is 60 plus percent of the state's revenues. You by if you have a budget adopted on July 1st, then you have a, a much clearer picture of what your revenues for the prior fiscal year were. And you it's, it makes you can make a better forecast of what the revenues for the coming year will be. Um, in general, it makes a lot more sense. And I think in general, it would result in better budgets. It doesn't, I mean, compared to those budgets that be enacted by the same people with the same priorities under a different schedule. It doesn't mean all budgets would be good. But I think they would be better. I think that they would it would be the process would inevitably be somewhat more transparent and that uh, the whole process would be better informed. Thanks, EJ. Uh, we just have two more questions in the chat, and I want to make sure we get to them for folks. Um, how are the state's many special agencies used throughout this process? Um, I'm not sure what special agencies you have in mind. If you're talking about public authorities, um, Public authorities are outside some several of public most public authorities, the major ones are outside the state budget, but are used uh, through the budget process as vehicles as basically as bonding entities, most notably um, the throughway authority, for instance, or the or the dormitory authority, which now does a whole lot of things that are other than dormitories uh, and they're used as financial entities as ways to finance projects through a contractual pledge of state revenues to underwrite the debt service. Um, they are not, they, that's the role that outside agencies, if you mean 
public authorities relate to the budget process. There's a couple of much smaller entities, um, the Health Research Institute and the Welfare Research Institute, which are odd off-budget agencies that deserve more attention, um, which are tiny by budgetary terms, but can be important as the uh, Health Research Institute became during the COVID era in terms of co contracting and research. But the public authorities are the big ones, and the budget can be conduits to public authorities, as the budget in recent years has become a conduit to the MTA of dedicated taxes and revenues, and they can be financing conduits into the state budget, as for years we've been doing with the Thruway Authority and the Dormitory Authority in particular. Thanks, EJ. And uh, lastly, so... Are you at all worried about the newly constituted Court of Appeals accepting cases that'll change some of the existing precedent, especially as related to the budget? Uh, I'm worried. I, I am worried about the newly constituted Court of Appeals in general, particularly the, the new chief judge, who I think is very much a result oriented jurist um, who is I think. I, we've already seen some indications is going to be a, uh, a, an unpredictable and uh, character motivated largely by his own preferences and possibly arguably partisanship, in my personal opinion. On the budget, I would suspect that the Court of Appeals will, re will tend to still side with a governor when it comes to some of the core issues that have come up before. Although it'll be interesting to see, the court is still divided it still has it still has a mix of very liberal and some moderate and moderately conservative judges as a legacy of the past um if it became if the the uh, um, cadres of progressive left-wing legislators in the legislature um had successfully promoted some budgetary strategy that arguably violated article 7 uh, by uh, going too far and trying to thwart some priority of the governor. Um, it'll be interesting to see what, what the court would do and what the new chief judge would, where the chief judge would come down in that case. I don't know. Um, it is a very different mix, and I'm not sure how they would decide these cases. Um, probably politics might have something to do with it in the minds of some of the judges. Uh, but it's a wild card, I would say. Perfect. So that, that is the end of our presentation. EJ, is there anything you want to kind of end with? Uh, one thing I would end with, and I meant to put up a slide on this, but we uh, issued an issue brief on this in the spring of 2019 called, the same title as this presentation, Unbalanced by Design. And we had a forum, a public forum in Albany that, that was produced a very interesting panel discussion that included Judge Smith, who wrote the court uh, majority opinion in the Pataki cases. The late Richard Brodsky, who was, a, as always, a very sharp observer and, and, and took positions on the other side of many of the things I've talked about and uh, is still missed, I think, in public debates about this. Uh, uh, Richard died, Dick died in the, uh, unfortunately, in the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, and so the panel is Judge Smith, Richard Brodsky, um, and Governor Patterson's former counsel. And then the final talk at that forum was by the current chairman of the Finance Committee, Liz Kruger. And I think it was a very interesting uh, panel discussion about all of these issues. If you go onto our website, empirecenter.org, and enter Unbalanced by Design, you'll find the issue brief that contains much of the background I talked about today. And you'll also can find the event video, which is still there, of the forum we had in the spring of 2019, which I think you'll find interesting, which had a range of views presented and explored a lot of these issues in more detail. Great. Well, thank you so much, EJ, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining. We hope you tune into our next Think New York webinar next month. Thank you all. Thank you.